Right, good evening everybody. It is six o'clock. So if I could thank you all for attending this hybrid meeting of the Scrutiny Committee with some members at the COVID Secure Civic Centre and some members joining my, by Microsoft Teams. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Councillor David Howarth and I'm the Chair of the Committee. Now, please note this is an audio and video meeting. It's being recorded and the stream will also be live on YouTube. The web address for this is displayed on the Council's website. Members are asked to keep their microphone on mute and only unmute when they wish to speak. The cabinet member and officers will present the report and I will then invite committee members to ask questions. If any committee members wish to speak, you should raise your hand and I will then invite you in order. Uh, before we proceed any further, for those who are joining us uh, from outside of the building, could I just ask you all to say at least hello so we know that we can hear you and you can hear us. So, Councillor Coulton. Good evening. Thank you. Councillor Alty. Hi. Councillor Green. Good evening. Uh, Councillor Matthew Tomlinson. Yeah, good evening, Chair. Uh, <laughs> Was it that one? Yeah. <laughs> I did explain earlier that I don't have bike. I need to take my glasses off to read my paperwork and I need my glasses on to actually see you all on the screen at the back. So, Karen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I believe Councillor Matt Campbell is on there somewhere. Good evening, Chair. And I think that's all of us. So, thank you for that. If I can then ask for apologies for absence, I have Councillor Mal Donoghue. Do we have any others? Um, in which case, are there any declarations of interest? Yes, please, for, for completeness, Chairman. Okay. Uh, th there's reference in, in the reports, I think, under item 6, uh, to the Boost uh, Growth Hub. Uh, that forms part of my portfolio at the County Council. Right, okay, thank you. We will note that declaration of interest. Do we have any others? In which case, if we can then move on to item three on the agenda, which is the minutes of the last scrutiny committee meeting held on the 9th of July, 2020. Uh, can I sign those off as a correct record? I have nods and nobody is saying no, so I'll sign those off. Yes. yes. Uh, Councillor Walton, Karen. Uh, yeah, can I just, yeah, can I just bring up a point on, um, it's on the South Ribble partnership update on page six. It, it says uh, members are requesting an update on the progress of implementing the RefairNet service. I don't think I've received any update on the RefairNet service. I don't know if any other members have. Could I just ask for an update on the RefairNet service, please? Right. Okay. Can we, okay. Uh, if we could obtain that for members and having done that, can I now sign the minutes off? Thank you. And item four is the minutes of the last scrutiny budget and performance panel. Can we note the minutes of that panel? Thank you. Uh, item five, matters arising sure. from previous... Yes, Councillor Thorburn. Sure. Uh, got a question. Uh, I attended this last the last meeting of this. Um, as I understand it, the scrutiny committee never actually put this forward as, as a separate panel. And I was actually quite shocked at the, the amount of um, information and stuff that was actually going through this cabinet, this 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 committee. And in the interest of fairness and transparency. I wouldn't want anything to be missed and I wouldn't want the administration to actually be have fingers pointed at it that this committee is actually bringing things forward and passing it under the nose of the scrutiny committee and actually subverting the scrutiny committee's powers. So I'm, I'm actually, you know, I actually do believe that most of this actually should come to the scrutiny committee. So I really do think that this, this panel should actually be collapsed and actually brought to the committee itself. It's quite um, quite a lot of stuff like the corporate strategy. We used to co we've covered this. 
you know, poor performance monitoring the week over this. So why is it actually becoming, you know, budget monitoring? Why aren't we looking at this as a panel as a whole and it not being missed out? And the whole actual committee being having a chance to monitor the, the panel. Right, can I bring Councillor Trafford in because he's just indicated. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's nothing in here that isn't usual procedure for the scrutiny committee. And if there are issues that councillors want to bring to the scrutiny committee, that's the responsibility of councillors on scrutiny committee to bring those to scrutiny committee. So I'm a little bit confused as to what the problem is there because there's nothing in here that I, um, that I don't see that isn't normal procedure. And then if it needs to come to scrutiny committee, that's up to the members on committee to bring that there. So I'm slightly confused on what the point is. Okay, Councillor Adams. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, I, as being a member of that committee, I mean, there is serious scrutiny that, that happens in those meetings. And you talk about transparency. Every party at council is representative on that committee. So in, in terms of your colleagues feeding back to you, I'm not sure if they have, but I can tell you that it's very robust. When we ask a lot of questions, as Councillor Trafford said, if you've got any issues, it's, there's always ways to feed it back. So in terms of transparency, I don't really see a point because all parties are part of that committee. Councillor Green, I believe you wish to come in. Thanks, Chairman. I, yeah, I, I actually wish, wish to support Councillor Thalborn's views. It, it's not the way traditionally scrutiny has been done at, at South Hibble at all. Um, and under various scrutiny chairman over the years, including Councillor Tomlinson, who, who's on the call this evening, and the items were brought to the full scrutiny committee, and I think it, it's right and proper that it should happen that way. Uh, with you as chairman, council, we have to make sure that we, we move forward in an open and transparent manner and give full regard to all the items with, which are coming forward uh, to cabinet and to council. I, I ultimately think that is in the best interest of the administration too, uh, for scrutiny to play its full and proper role and, and to, to, to form judgments on the policy which are coming forward and help to add value to that and uh, to give it a, a much wider view of the full scrutiny committee rather than a smaller panel which hasn't been established in the proper manner in any case. And so I would, I would all heartedly support the views of, of Councillor Philborn uh, and wish that we would re-look at this, bring this back into scrutiny and scrutiny members so that we can give full uh, full regard to all items moving forward. Thank you. Uh, I believe Councillor Matthew Tomlinson would like to come in. Only because my name was used in vain, Mr Chairman, um, that's all. Um, I think there's a couple of points, isn't there? Um, the management of the business of scrutiny uh, is the prerogative of the chair. Um, and so it's your job to manage the workload of the scrutiny committee. And we can see at tonight's meeting, we're going to be here for quite a while. Um, and I, I, made, I raised that point because I'm here for agenda item eight. Um, so I'm going to be here for quite a while. Um, the fact that this is done improperly, I dispute that absolutely. This is a panel. It's not a committee. Um, it's a panel, a sub-panel of the scrutiny committee. Um, and the fact that it's avoiding well, the transparency and openness, the minutes are there for everybody to see. Um, everybody can ask questions. I've, I've appeared before this panel. Let me tell you, there is scrutiny going on at that panel. And I'm sure if someone thinks they're somehow being kept away from scrutinising it, um, they could volunteer to be on the panel, I guess. Um, but I, I, I have heard some very, very odd comments. You're the chair, uh, Mr Chairman, um, and I suggest you get on and run it as you see fit. Uh, thank you for that. Would anybody else like to come in before I respond? Councillor Sharples. Yeah, just a, a point on having this as a separate committee. When I, when I went to some scrutiny training recently, <clears throat> a lot of the other councils and authorities that were at that meeting, all of them, almost all of them had several different scrutiny strands. In fact, some of the Manchester ones had something like 12 different committees that looked at different scrutiny items, but they still came together in a main meeting afterwards. It, we were actually the odd one out almost, having just one scrutiny committee. 
and I really feel that what we do now works admirably. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll say first and foremost about transparency. Um, I think you need to ask Councillor Mick Titherington as to whether anybody gets a free ride with me. Uh, he'll assure you they don't. Um, in terms of whether this has been done correctly and is it correct procedure, I'm not aware that up until 18 months ago there even was a scrutiny budget and performance panel. Um, this is something that was introduced by the new administration to improve the way we go about scrutiny, um, not to hide anything away um, and ensure that uh, things are done without it properly being out in the open. I'm prepared to go away and consider this again. I'm prepared to have a report brought back to the next scrutiny committee. Um, but personally, I don't see that, that, that anything here is untoward or is being done improperly. And on that note, I intend to move on to item five. Okay, if Councillor Green wants to come back. Uh, just, just briefly, if I may, Chairman, if you're going to take it away and reconsider it and the report comes to the next meeting, I think that's a sensible way forward. Uh, but just to pick up on one point that Councillor Sharp has raised, that panel is not a separate committee. It, it reports back to the scrutiny committee, yet we didn't establish it. So it's, it's a rather bizarre arrangement, um, but I'll leave it at that for now and uh, we can look at it again for the next meeting. Thank you. Well, just one final note on this. Um, the scrutiny committee didn't um, bring this committee about, but full council did, and full council ultimately is the decision-making body of this council. So I am now going to move on to item five, which is matters arising from previous scrutiny committee meetings. You have a list there within your agenda. Um, can we review the response to previous recommendations and can we agree that those that have been implemented are now removed from the table? I have a proposal to that end. Uh, Councillor Sharp, also. Councillor Coulton, do you want to come in or are you uh, indicating that you agree with that? Yeah, okay. If we can agree that, if we can then move on to item six, which is the South Ribble Community Wealth Building Action Plan. If I could welcome uh, Councillor Aniela Belinsky Gelder, the Cabinet Member for Community Engagement, Social Justice and Wealth Building. And if I could also welcome Matthew Bakariza Jackson, uh, who is an independent policy advisor, and he will give us a presentation uh, following the introduction by Aniela. And I think 10 out of 10 for me getting two very difficult names right there, I, I hope. So, Councillor Bilinski Gelder, please uh, feel free to, to uh, present this. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the officers which have been involved in development of this action plan. Um, lots of legal um, procurement from both Chorley and South Ribble have both been involved in this. And then I'd like to thank on behalf of myself, the officers and the members, Matthew Bakariza Jackson, for working with us throughout the COVID crisis to develop an action plan which is bespoke to South Ribble. Second, I'd like to emphasise that this is an action plan. It's not a framework or a strategy, but an action plan where you can see who will be involved in doing what and what the tangible benefits and outcomes may be. So why community wealth building? This action plan has been expediated in the context of the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, the Centre for Local Economic Strategy, CLES, produced a timely report rescue, recover and reform, which we considered significant in the current context. I proposed to the Cabinet way back in June that we look at a new model of economic development after two crises in the 10 years, first the financial crisis and now COVID-19. I think and the Cabinet do that we need to think where do we want to be in five years time when the potential next crisis is around? Working backwards from there, where should we begin now? Asking questions like, how can we ensure a business community are more resilient in five years? And how can we recover and reform better so we're not necessarily relying on central government? After 40 years of trickle-down economics, what we call traditional economics, food banks are still increasing, life expectancy in and around Leyland, my own ward, and also South Ribble is still decreasing and the wages have stagnated. So this action plan will help to develop localising wealth, supporting and cooperating with partners and businesses 
and asking other businesses in the area to follow our lead. Over the next three to five years, South Ribble Council could see £85 million worth of procurement in our extra care scheme, leisure centre, Leyland Town deal, Mackenzie Arms site and other developments around employment, housing and leisure. This action plan will ensure that as much of that money and the benefits associated around skills and employment will be retained within South Ribble, making businesses and communities more resilient for future. I look forward to hearing any recommendations from the scrutiny panel. I'd just like to pass you over to Matthew. Um, thanks very much, uh, Councillor Bylinsky Gelder, and thank you, Chair, for the invitation. Um, I'm Matthew Bakarisa Jackson. I'm an independent policy advisor. Um, I've been undertaking work around community wealth building for the last 10 years um, in places ranging from Clackmannanshire in Scotland to Cleveland in the United States to Wellington in New Zealand to Koshalin in Poland and now in South Ribble. And I've very much enjoyed the experience of working in South Ribble. Um, my one key comment is that this is not just an action plan for South Ribble Borough Council, this is an action plan for South Ribble as a place. It's relevant for anchor institutions, which are the key public sector institutions with a stake in the locality. It's relevant for business, it is relevant for the voluntary and community sector, and most importantly, it is relevant for people and communities. So the action plan is framed by the five pillars of community wealth building. And these are things we want to cooperatively adapt, amend and shift to realise better outcomes for South Ribble, economically, socially and environmentally. So the five things, it's about progressing the way we as a local authority undertake procurement. This is about supporting South Ribble based businesses to bid for procurement opportunities, but also to maximise the social value generated through procurement. It's about delivering additional economic, social and environmental benefit for our economy and for our people. Second, it's about our workforce and as a council and the workforce of those other anchor institutions and business. It's important that workers are treated fairly, paid a decent wage and have the opportunity to progress. And that is also what the, what the action plan is about. Third, it's about diversifying our economy and creating the conditions for more democratic businesses to evolve and flourish within South Ribble. Fourth, it's about ensuring that we use our planning powers and development potential to realise wider community benefits. As, as uh, Councillor Balinci Gelder said, there's a significant amount of resource coming into South Ribble in, in the future. We need to make sure that is harnessed and brings maximum benefit for the economy and for people. And fifthly, it's about ensuring that wealth reaches more residents through credit unions and other forms of more democratic ownership of the economy. This is a medium term approach to re realising better outcomes. The action plan is about delivering a better place for the people of South Ribble and surrounding areas. Um, it's been a real honour and pleasure to work with South Ribble Borough Council on this and I hope that the recommendations in the action plan bear fruition in the coming years. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay, thank you. If I could now uh, open this up to questions from members of the committee. Um, I have the first question, which is, the wealth building model seems to lend itself to city areas and large unitaries which are on a big scale. Do you think that this could be effectively scaled down to a shire district such as South Ribble? Thank you. That's probably one of the first questions I had myself, um, because obviously this is very similar to the Preston model. And I know that other places all around the country, if you look into the Cooperative Innovation Networks um, booklet, they're doing similar things. Um, but when you sit down and think about what we've got in South Ribble, we do have large public and private sector procure procurers who spend a lot of money on goods and services. So, for example, Lancashire Constabulary, Runshaw College, Laydaff, British Aerospace is a huge one with supply chains, construction companies, ourselves, South Ribble Borough Council, we're expecting to take the lead, Progress Housing, the healthcare sector, and the um, development of employment sites with external contractors, which may come in. Um, I don't know if Matthew would like to say more about that. 
I think um, geography is just one factor of community wealth building. I think of, of far more interest for me is the concept of social value. Um, I don't think it matters whether a, a supplier to the council is based in South Ribble or South End or Southampton or South Lanarkshire. What is important is that that supplier brings benefit for the for the economy and for the people um, of South Ribble. So a lot of the other community wealth building studies, including that undertaken in uh, Preston has focused very much upon this concept of localising spend. I think that's a little bit of a challenge and it's a little bit dangerous to focus just upon drawing resource into the local economy through through the supply chain. What's really important is that business behaviour, regardless of where they're based, is changed to bring economic, social and environmental benefit for South Ribble. So we need to look at this intelligently in terms of the geography. It's not just about localising spend, this is about delivering a range of economic, social and environmental benefits for a place. Okay, thank you. If I could just come back on that. I mean, you have made reference to Preston City Council. Um, I would have thought that given their current financial problems, that might be an example of how not to run a council, not an example of how we should. You have referred to other local authorities across the UK. Do you have other examples of that we might be able to go away and have a look at? I mean, th there's 30 or 40 local authorities across the UK that have developed similar community wealth building action plans um, in London, uh, Lambeth um, and Camden are two such authorities. Birmingham have undertaken work um, around this and a number of authorities in the northeast um, of England as well. Um, I take the point that there is a kind of a focus upon urban city geographies, um, but there are examples of smaller authorities, including in places like Wakefield, which have undertaken uh, work around community wealth building as well. So there's there's plenty of examples on the Centre for Local Economic Strategies website. They've got a community wealth building centre for excellence, um, which demonstrates uh, examples of those um, community wealth building action plans and strategies. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I bring in Councillor Lomax? Yeah. Uh, what evidence base has been used in the development of the action plan and what local data and knowledge of the local need has been used? Um, I think that maybe Jonathan Node, um, who's got expert in, is the expert in local businesses, and then perhaps Matthew can come back on this. Yeah, sorry, could I welcome Jonathan Node, yeah. first of all, <laughs> who I missed off the list earlier. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so the process we, we've been through is, has been really en engaging. Um, so we've obviously had a, a core officer group on this who are drawing expertise from, from all, all different sectors of, of the organisation. Um, more, more recently, we've actually taken this, this action plan out to the, um, the um, local strategic partnership, South River Partnership, um, and obviously there's organisations on there. You've got Runshaw College, the NHS, um, the lo local enterprise partnership as well. So we, we've, we've got bit going through an engagement process at the moment to test test that. Um, the next stage we're actually doing, and this is this is happening next week, is is businesses in terms of evidence base. So we're getting evidence from businesses um, as well. It has been, I've got to say, hard to engage with them so far because of the COVID res restrictions. Normally we'd we'd be able to bribe them with a with a bacon and egg sandwich and bring them into the civic, but we've not been able to do do that this time. But but there's a session. Um, next week on that. We've obviously got um, a lot of expertise in our own economic development unit um, as well and that they understand what the business's needs are within South Ribble and what the specific is issues are as well. So Jennifer Clough's team has been heavily um, in involved in, in, in this as, as well. I don't, don't find yellow and Matthew wants to add anything. Just one th further thing to add, thanks Jonathan. Um, the evidence has also come from a review of wider procurement processes and practices which um, I undertook across Lancashire this time last year. Um, so I worked with 15 local authorities um, across Lancashire to, to understand what they were doing around social value and procurement including working with Councillor Green and the, and the County Council um, as well um, and that evidence has shaped um, part of the components of the action plan. And um, I think this has been a really um, inclusive process. Um, the five pillars have been framed by workshops with officers um, to develop the actions and to develop the recommendations. So there's been a, a range of officer led intervention that has enabled the, the actions and the recommendations to be developed. OK, thank you. If I could just quickly come back there, because you did allude to the workshops that are still going on with the partnership and local businesses. Um, and yet 
that comes under a heading under under item 12 of consultation carried out an outcome of consultation if those consultations are still ongoing and haven't been completed um, how do we actually know what the outcome is Do you want me to come back in there, there Chair? Um, yeah, yeah, the business one, we, we were due to meet businesses um, around three weeks ago. Unfortunately, we had to cancel cancel um, that, that event. Um, the, the aim of the action plan is to take it into um, Cabinet in November, so it will be held before then. And obviously, we're con consulting with scrutiny tonight as part of that process as, as, as well. So it's anything that comes out of that business session will, will, will be fed into the final action plan that goes to Cabinet. Yeah, the unfortunate thing of that is that it's then not going to come before scrutiny because it's going to cabinet. Um, but anyway, if that's where we are, that's where we are. Can I bring in uh, Councillor Sharples? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. How will success be measured? When will we know that we have achieved the action plan and how is the action plan going to be performance managed? Thank you. Yes. Okay. I do. Thanks for that. Um, so one of the recommendations of the action plan is that we employ a social value officer. Um, they'll be a monitoring officer to ensure that, for example, if we if we start a contract on the extra care scheme and we're looking at the quantity of social value. Um, so, for example, we have to. This is this was a draft action plan, and we have to use the new employees to establish all the targets and the monitoring outcomes. So if we do employ a contractor or various contractors, for example, to run the extra care scheme, um, they'll be tasked with maintaining the legally binding commitments um, of what the contractors agreed to. So in other areas, for example, we've, um, we've not we, other areas have um, contractors do work for them and they promise to employ three apprentices or local plasterers and electricians, but this social value monitor officer will make sure that they do that month by month um, and keep an eye on it. In addition to that, there's a social value portal, um, which I think that maybe Jonathan can speak a bit more about, but that talks about percentages in terms of values of environmental, um, employment and skills and things like that, and it measures it up so we know what our outcomes could be. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add to that, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think what, what we're aiming to do is actually get the monitoring as part of, part of the core performance uh, that the council does. Um, it, it, needs to, it needs to be part and parcel of the corporate plan and how we monitor monitors that, um, so that. That's one route forward. Um, yes, there's a recommendation about actually we, we do need to resource it if we need to, if we're going to measure it properly. Um, so that, that is, is in there. Uh, and Anne Alia says that there is this social value um, portal as well so there's ready-made indicators out there which, which are um, almost like national indicators that people use who are ambitious with this this kind of thing, thing as well so we will be using using the, those measures um, as well to, to measure this okay thank you just one very quick point I mean one I've worked with hundreds of authorities around procurement processes and this is the most frustrating aspect of embedding social value into procurement we go to the effort of embedding um, questions around social value into procurement exercises. We evaluate against them, but local authorities don't really monitor the impact and don't really kind of collect outputs around social value. So I think this approach will place South Ribble is a bit colloquial, but ahead of the game when it comes to social value, value procurement by actually having that demonstrable evidence of the impact this is gonna, gonna have upon the economy and upon residents and upon achieving wider outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jackie Olty. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Karen Walton, I believe you wanted to come in. Yeah, it's just a, a, an extra question, really. Um, has there been a timetable planned for uh, what risks and evidence and outcomes of, of the um, action plan? And how will it be presented to scrutiny? And will what the achievements are and what has, hasn't been able to be delivered? Is there a process of presenting it to scrutiny and to council? Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I think once this action plan has been to scrutiny and then cabinet, there will be an implementation plan. And that's where the projects and the recommendations will be laid out in terms of timely. Um, I would hope that there would be a 12 months report 
on our social value outcomes and also every council report should have a social value outcome on it just like there's an air quality one and a financial one okay thank you okay uh, if i can bring councillor jackie alty in hi thank you um, much of the action plan is reliant on others to get on board rather than with the direct control of the council how far does the council's influence extend with many of the proposals in the action plan um, i think that um jonathan might be able to give us more idea on this because he works closely with jennifer um, and Jennifer's involved in, I suppose, the sprawling um, part of this and how we can um, help and support other people. But I think from the point of view, for me anyway, this is about us getting our own house in order first, setting the example um, and then asking other people to potentially support us, but also working in partnership. So we're saying that we'll buy things off you and you can buy things off us and things like that. But I think Jonathan might be able to exp um, expand on that. Yeah, th thanks. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of this is aimed at getting our own house in order and how we do things. As South Ribble Borough Council, obviously, we're a big contributor to the economy um, ourselves. And if we're leading by example, it's ho it's, it's hope that we, we can really sell um, this to other organisations out there. We've already started the process through the work with the South Ribble Partnership. Uh, in terms of getting other other key stakeholders on, on board, and and since since that workshop that, that we ran ran a few few weeks ago, we've had a number of those organisations contact us saying they're really interested in this and they want to work with us uh, and want to embed similar things in, in their own organisations um, as well. Yes, we're doing work with businesses that that's starting. Um, next week and there's obviously some really big businesses out there in the borough um bae systems leyland daff um dr urka etc we know a lot of those, those businesses are interested in social value it, it does benefit them um as well well do, doing this as well so um a lot of it will be will be selling the ideas out there but a, a big bit is getting our own house in order first uh, and then we can then we can be using ourselves as a shining example uh, of what to do and the, and the benefits arising from that Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Will Adams, you indicated you would like to come in. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just uh, in regards to uh, COVID-19 and the difficulty that uh, businesses have faced, do we think um, there is an opportunity here to kind of talk to businesses and engage with them? I think one of the benefits of, or one of the good things to come out of COVID-19, not that there's many, is that communities are looking after each other, and that's businesses as well as residents. Do you think there's an opportunity to talk to businesses to say there is a different direction and how how are you going to be able to come on board with us? Um, I'll speak first and I think Matthew wants to speak. So yeah, um, Will, you've been involved in a really good business recovery um, group and that's definitely something that I think we could engage with moving forward. But also off the officer, um, Howard Anthony, he's been having requests for information from businesses on how they can do things differently and how they can support local um, communities and local businesses as well. So there's definitely not. I think Matthew wants to say something. I mean, the, the whole crux of community wealth building is about organisations across the public, the commercial and the social sectors working to get together collaboratively to address the challenges that we face. And I think that's the beauty of this action plan is it actually brings those different institutions closer, closer together. And linked to the last question, the role of the, the local authority is very much about enabling and about influencing and working collaboratively with those organisations to deliver to deliver better outcomes um, as part of that. Thank you. Uh, can I bring in Councillor Stephen Thilborn? Or have you gone? Oh, I'm here. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Chair. I was just getting my paperwork together. Could this not have a negative view from some sectors of the business community even through planning and through all the pillars that you've progressed out, Matt? Sorry, that was to the consultant, sorry. The message to the consultant. Okay, um, I'm not quite sure I completely understand the, the question, but I think perhaps it relates to kind of smaller businesses and the extent to which they can kind of contribute in terms of social value terms. Um, yes. Yeah, I think there's, um, I think there is a challenge for small business. Um, I, I run my own organisation. I'm the only employee of that organisation. I found, find council procurement 
process is really difficult um, in terms of the, the bureaucracy and the paperwork. Um, I think that the, some of these um, actions should only apply above certain thresholds or certain values um, in terms of procurement and would recommend that that is above £30,000. So the questions that are asked around social value only apply to tenders above a certain threshold so that we're influencing perhaps the behaviour of larger businesses as, a, as opposed to placing greater requirements on smaller businesses to provide further evidence as part of procurement exercises. So I think there needs to be a threshold to some of these activities and actions. Okay. Can I have a quick follow-up, another quick follow-up as well, Chair? Yeah. Yeah, fire away. Could this not be to Councillor Belinsky Gander? Could this not see as the council selling it some of its assets off? Um, I'm going to have to ask you to clarify what you mean. Do you mean something specifically? Because we're not selling anything. Things of like social justice, use of land, and things such as that. Um, we're not. It's not that we would sell anything. It's that when we when we spend money, we make sure that it's spent ethically with the environment in mind. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Right, okay. Um, so, further on in the report, you talk about the 13 houses that you're going to build in Bamber Bridge that you're going to give them over to an anchor source, an anchor, one of the anchor companies. So, is that not selling it off, or are we just giving them over to a company? Right, sorry, Councillor Thurber, I need to stop you here because first and foremost, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody really understands what this point is um, or that your question is actually based on any factual background. Um, I was bringing you in to ask a question on anchor institutions. That's the word I was asked to, after, sir. Would you like to, oh sorry, uh, Councillor Matthew Tomlinson, you indicated you'd like to come in. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm not quite sure where uh, Councillor Thurlborn's coming from either. Can I reassure all members of the committee that when we build these houses on the Mackenzie Arms, they will be retained and owned by South Ribble Borough Council? And I have nothing else to say on it. Thank you. Right, if we can move on, Councillor Thurlborn, do you have a, a question on anchor institutions? It's just been answered. Thank you, Chair. Right, in which case I'll, I'll, I'll put the question. Um, could you advise us as to what are anchor institutions? The report mentions that anchor institutions are often public sector. Uh, what public sector organisations do you envisage taking part in South Ribble and are they large enough to make an impact? Yep, um, there's, there's five key characteristics to anchor institutions. As you're right, they're often public sector institutions, but the, the five characteristics are they spend lots of money buying goods and services, um, they employ lots of people so they create and sustain lots of jobs, um, they own lots of land and assets within the locality, um, they often have a democratic mandate and they're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to suddenly leave South Ribble and go go elsewhere. So we're talking about organisations like hospitals, um, CCGs, housing associations, colleges, and there are plenty of those types of organisations in South Ribble um, that have a significant amount of wealth, um, which can potentially be harnessed more effectively for the benefit of the economy and for the benefit of South Ribble residents. So that's a definition of an anchor institution, a large public sector institution that spends lots of money and has lots of influence in the inner place. Thank you. Um, if I can quickly follow up and then bring in Councillor Coulton, I'll just follow up first. Um, so I'm assuming that there has been work done to actually quantify this. Yes, and there's a, an understanding of the scale of the extent of the spend of these institutions um, and that is around kind of the procurement spend across those organisations. Um, South Ribble Borough Council spends about £35 million pounds a year buying goods and services across those other institutions. The, the total then becomes around about £300 million pounds a year buying goods and services through the procurement process alone. But those other organisations, as I just explained, have lots and lots of other influence as well. Okay, thank you. 
Can I look? Could I just ask Matthew as well to explain about the procurement network that we have across um, Lancashire? Thanks for the additional question, <laughs> Councillor Bielinski <laughs> Kelder. Um, yeah, so there's, a, there's already an existing procurement network which brings together anchor institutions across Lancashire. Um, that includes um, the University of Central Lancashire, as well as um, local authority representation, representation of colleges, um, and uh, health trusts as well. So the the uh, Central Lanc Lancashire Health organisations are involved in that that network as well. That is about exchanging knowledge and learning around how those institutions can deliver more effective procurement processes. And by more effective procurement processes, I mean both deliver value for money in its more traditional sense um, around um, um, efficient public services, but also deliver that social value that, we're, that forms a key component part of the of the action plan. Okay, thank you. That's the first time we've had somebody scrutinise themselves. But if I can bring Councillor Coulton in, Colin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it mentioned lots of lots in this paragraph. Can, uh, is there any quantify? Um, has the term lots been quantified into, you know, it mentions it regarding employing people, owning land, which seems to me to be quite vague. Is that, you know, can this be quantified? I think you've already answered that. Uh, Councillor Colton, I think that really was answered uh, in my follow-up question. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is part of the the role of the the monitoring of the action plan. I think it's important that the next stage of this is to develop some very specific, measurable outcomes and outputs that will be against which data will be collected as part of this. Um, and I think those outcomes will fit across a range of different outcomes. And this is where the action plan links really to the corporate plan. Um, and also the partnerships uh, community strategy as well. And this is about this is about creating and sustaining jobs. It's about improving skills. It's about developing the capacity and capability of business. Um, it's about reducing carbon emissions. So there's a range of different measurable outcomes that this action plan can potentially contribute towards. We need to make sure that we get those those metrics in place though and that's where the the nationally defined um themes outcomes and measures as jonathan explained earlier comes in to play as well okay thank you if i could bring in councillor michael green who has a question on external engagement thanks chairman um could i ask the portfolio order to talk us through what external engagement has taken place with external partners and businesses in developing the action plan and what has the response been from those businesses in the approach uh, and we'll have a couple of supplementaries chairman thank you thank you um i think that um jonathan node uh, made it clear earlier that we still have to um, consult with some businesses. However, I did present to the South Ribble Partnership um, a few weeks ago, and on that was yourself, um, Progress Housing, Runshaw, British Aerospace, Healthcare Providers, um, the usual people that were that attend that, um, and so and and also the Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, Progress had already produced a document for us to read um, saying what they recommended, um, saying what they agreed with, what they didn't, where, what they, what, and basically what they wanted to know is what we were asking them for and what we were going to offer them. And I think in terms of communicating to businesses, that is the best approach. What are we actually asking them for and what are we going to offer them? Um, but in addition to that, the local enterprise <coughs> partnership said that they're already really well equipped with social value and they, they would offer us any support in terms of measure, measuring, monitoring or working out how we'd go about that. Okay, thank you. Would you like to come back? Yes, please. Thank you for the response, but, but I am a little confused, uh, to be honest, because, because the report, whilst I note Mr Nord's response earlier, page 24, paragraph 7, sets out that the action plan has been developed um, via extensive engagement with businesses um, and it's, it's, it's this is crucial to how the action plan moves forward 
So whilst the council is an important player, it's success is reliant on other key stakeholders and businesses embracing the action plan. So if that engagement with businesses hasn't taken place yet, I'm struggling to see why we're at this point of, of this action plan being presented to us. So on the, if it hasn't, the, the cabinet member will, will affirm whether it is taking place or not. If it hasn't, what further engagement is planned to ensure that we take part in the moving forward? Uh, and also, we need businesses to be successful in South Um if, if we're going to provide employment opportunities for residents moving forward, if we're going to provide tax revenues which are then used to fund services which we all need to fund, be it locally or nationally. So in terms of ensuring that businesses are, have an opportunity to be successful, what engagement have we carried out with business organisations such as the local Chamber of Commerce, which would be the North, North and Western Lancashire Chamber, uh, the Federation of Small Businesses, uh, the Institute of Directors uh, and the CBI? Um, could the portfolio holder um, respond whether we've actually engaged with any of those organisations? And if not, um, would, she, would she confirm that we will engage with them moving forward? Thank you. Um, yeah, I can't tell you any more than I already have in terms of who we've engaged with. I'm not going to make it up. Um, but that list that you've just given us will be really helpful moving forward and we'll make sure that we engage with all of those. Matthew would like to speak. Just very quickly, Councillor Green, we've got um, um, a meeting planned with the local business community for the 4th of the, 4th of November, I think it is Wednesday the 4th of November, um, where the Federation of Small Business, the Chamber of Commerce and various other employers will be present and that is part of that consultation ex exercise to uh, explain the, the draft action plan and then to kind of seek um, further thoughts on the action plan from the perspective of the business community. Okay, thank you. Would you like to come back again or are you okay with that? Uh, no, I'm, I'm okay for okay. now. Thank you. Right, thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Will Adams, I believe you wanted to come in here. No? Okay, thank you. If I can then move on to Councillor Karen Walton, um, who has a question about planning and development decisions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, page 24, paragraph 8, uh, pillar 4, socially just use of land. References made to ensure that planning and development decisions bring community benefits. Uh, this does appears uh, it doesn't happen at the moment. What difference will we see in utilising the assets of the authority in this way? And how does it fit in with the planning committee's obligation to make decisions on plan planning law? Thank you. I think the best person is a director of planning to answer. That. Right, Jonathan, fire away. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th thanks for that question. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is an area where, where we are already doing um, w work in this council and indeed across the central Lancashire area. So we do have a supplementary planning document um, in place at the moment. Uh, and for, for developments that hit a certain threshold, they have to submit to us the employment and skills plan. Uh, and that is all about um, apprenticeships, training uh, for local people, jobs for local people. Um, so when big developers say big house builders come on, they've got to submit an employment and skills plan to us. Uh, and that is assessed against the um, CITB scoring matrix um, that is nationally recognised um, um, score, scoring um, to identify apprenticeships and, and how we can create local jobs and training for, for people. So that's what one aspect um, we're, we're already doing. Um, obviously, looking at different mixed use schemes that come into planning, there's a lot of community benefits that can, can arise from that. Um, so obviously, you're seeing things like the Leyland Town deal um, emerging. That's going to have really big benefits and a lot of some of these actions will be enabled by, by that development. Um, as well and then there's, there's obviously the, our, our own developments we've, we've mentioned the home build um, as well I think as part of the procurement process in terms of building those we'd be looking um, for contractors to be bringing along um, training local supply chain um, be benefits as, as well and then there's obviously our, our own assets portfolio as well in terms of what benefit that that could have um, to, to benefit the community um, as well so it's quite it's quite multi-dimensional that there is the formal planning process um, side of it where we do have a, an existing lever and through the emerging lo local plan I think we, we'd look to develop that that further and have have bigger asks of developers in this borough. Okay thank you and for our array of people out there watching what is the CIBT? 
CITB uh, is the National Construction Skills Training Body. Um, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, you okay with that, Karen? Yes, uh, Councillor Thurlborn, I believe you wanted to come in here. I was just explaining, I think you've cut, uh, I think Jonathan Nord's actually answered my question. It was about actually employment and how planning works with employment to, with local funders, actually. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. If we can move on to Councillor Colin Coulton, uh, who has a question on utilising pension funds. Thank you again, Chair. Uh, on page 25, it mentions utilising uh, the uh, council's pensions funds for community in a community-focused way. What concerns me, how will this be achieved, uh, seeing that uh, we're part of the Lancashire Pension Fund? And how will you ensure that the fund's investments are guaranteed to give maximum uh, interest or whatever uh, for the pension uh, fund re uh, recipients. Thank you. I think, Councillor Coulter, this is more about uh, cross-authority relationships and cross-authority working. So this is not about South Ribble utilising those pension funds directly. This is about working with Lancashire County Council and through the, the Lancashire Pension Fund um, to utilise those pension funds in slightly more potentially ethical ways than is currently the case. Um, this is something that Preston City Council have worked closely with the with the county on um, in terms of a number of regeneration schemes um, across across Lancashire. So this is not specific to South Ribble. This is more about how the council works collaboratively with other local authorities to deliver better outcomes through that through that pension investment. But still, how can you guarantee that the pension fund money? and the interest accrued is as good as some other investments might be. I think there's been, I mean, I'm not an, an expert in this, uh, Councillor Coulter, but I think there's been a number of pieces of research that have been undertaken um, and I can send material around this following this, this meeting um, of where organisations have looked at the scope for pension funds um, to invest in regeneration act activity and looked at the returns in comparison to other forms of investment. Um, and I'm quite happy to share that, that research afterwards. But as I say, I'm not an expert in this. Thank you. Right, I'll I'll not ask my question then because I'm clearly not going to get an answer. So, uh, Councillor Coulton, I think you have a, a another question. It's I have, Chair. Thank you. Uh, page twenty-five. It mentions employing uh, two more officers. What tangible benefits will we get from the employment of these uh, officers? And it says on um, that one of the officers will be to deliver whatever outcomes. And then the second one is to monitor the action plan, which seems to me to be a little bit of a superfluous to requirements. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's not about monitoring the action plan per se, it's about monitoring the outcomes. Um, so if there's going to be a significant amount of investment through procurement um, over the next three years, for example, I think we talked about a figure of £85 million. We want to know not only what impact that has in financial terms and the quality of the goods and services provided, but what contribution that makes to those wider outcomes, whether that be around jobs or skills or carbon emissions, etc. So that the point of the social value officer is to really build up that evidence base that you were talking about earlier um, and to really kind of provide evidence that enables the council to make more strategic decisions moving forward um, as well. Um, there's quite a lot of work in each of these five pillars and these five pillars of actions, which is why there's the two posts. The first post is very much about implementation, developing that partnership, further partnership relationship through the South River Partnership, and then kind of monitoring the impact. So that's the, that's the distinction between the two. Right. Can I just bring Gary Hall in? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the report does identify that um, for this policy and plan to be effective, 
uh, it needs monitoring. Um, I think Jonathan alluded to this earlier. The report recommends uh, two additional officers. Um, the initial task will, will be for us to determine whether actually the officers we've currently got and the resources we've currently got can absorb that work or not. If that doesn't prove to be the case, then clearly there will have to be a business case put forward to uh, uh, to supplement that, which will mean a, a decision for the council about putting additional resources in uh, to meet its policy. Do you want to add to that? Right. Um, yeah, I think I think my question on this, you've answered it, which is what is the opportunity cost or the financial cost if we're moving two officers from one area to another? What's the opportunity cost if we're not? What's the cost of taking them on? But you, you've answered that. So. We, the, the council's invested quite recently in a number of areas um, where there are resources available, perhaps to pick some of these things up, maybe not all of it. And that's something I'll be looking at uh, as part of this plan. OK, thank you. Um, Councillor Will Adams. Thanks, Chair. Uh, take you to page 25, paragraph 10, uh, recommendation three. Um, References made to communicating and promoting community wealth building. How do you intend to do this? How could the concept be made more user friendly and understandable to residents? As I know that uh, in other councils, I know if you go on the longer street and ask people what community wealth building is, many residents actually wouldn't have the foggiest idea. So how can we as a council communicate that better? Thanks for that. Um, this is something that we discussed in quite a lot of detail, um, especially like when we're comparing um, the what the Preston model um, and like Matthew said a few times that um, if you stood on Preston High Street and said to someone, oh, what do you think about the Preston model? 200 people didn't know what it was. So, but in terms of procurement and the amount of money that it retained, um, it was effective, but in terms of the communication. So for me, it's really important that if we are to employ contractors that bring social value, um, which means increasing the number of apprenticeships, that the people who get those apprenticeships know that they've got them because of the decisions that have been made through this action plan and because of the changes to procurement. And I think after speaking to comms, I think the best way is to produce case studies. So people that have gone from being unemployed or unskilled to being um, skilled and employed um, and the case study from start to finish, which will resonate with other people. Um, in terms of a slogan, I don't think that um, I don't necessarily think we need anything like the Wigan deal or anything like that. But I do think the progress is idea of an ask and uh, what can we offer that might be quite that might be something that we might look into so i'm avoiding pies puns at the moment so um you okay with that oh, yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, can councillor karen walton uh, thank you chair on page 25 paragraph 11 the final version of the action plan is going to be tabled at cabinet in november as the action plan is so new and, as we've heard tonight, is not yet completed uh, such wide, and has such widespread implications for the Council and the Borough, should not this be debated at full Council as it affects all the wards in the Borough and will probably eventually be a key decision? And I think hearing all the evidence tonight, I think members have a right to know, uh, more, have more information on the action plan before it become, becomes um, comes to cabinet, as um, I think most members would be unaware of what the implications of the action plan will be to the borough. Thank you. I don't think that I can answer the questions around which meetings they go to. I think that has to be democratic services. But I do think that it would be good if scrutiny recommended maybe a learning hour for members um, and maybe Matthew could, we could ask Matthew to do those learning hours. So that would be useful, I think. Um, I accept that, but that isn't really members then taking the decision. Sorry, uh, Councillor Foster. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I think you probably find there's a very good chance that once this has been through Cabinet, Cabinet would send it to Council for discussion and um, debate. Um, an adoption because ultimately, and it doesn't say that it um, well, we wouldn't do that, but um, clearly Cabinet will, will not make any unilateral decisions that it's not permitted to do, Chair. And so clearly, you know, and all members, are, as they do, often 
you know, attend the cabinet meetings as well and they're free to question and uh, any any decisions that are being made. But as I'm sat here, sat next to the chief executive, you know, there's a, there's, it says that it's going to be tabled to cabinet. Cabinet may well decide that it needs to conform to council. So I think we have sort of half an assurance there. So uh, we need to await the, de the decision of cabinet. Can I come back on that, can, please, yes. Chair? Yeah, it's just that I, I agree with the, the Cabinet member that I think a learning hour would be very useful as it's such a big decision and, and will have such a big impact on the way the Council works and on its residents, all residents. I think it should we should uh, involve all members more. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Coulton. Worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, cooperatives are mentioned several times throughout the report. Uh, how do we know there's a need for these cooperatives and how, are, if they are going to happen, how will we achieve them? Thanks for that. Um, I think out of all of the pillars, this might be the one, you know, even for the Labour group that might scare the horses the most. Um, I don't think we should set out and say, we're going to set up 10 co worker cooperatives in South Ribble in the next five or 10 years. I don't think that's the objective. It isn't about saying that. Um, the top line argument for why co-ops is that cooperative workplaces prevent a division between capital and labour from occurring preventing like alienation so people make it so in in the current economy people are making things which they themselves cannot afford to buy or where a factory or business owner reaps all the surpluses while paying less than the real living wage to workers so what co-ops do um, is provide an opportunity for um, de the democrats to fill in the democratic deficit so we have voting around politics but we don't have any democratic um, awareness around finances. Um, in anticipation of the question they don't work, the answer is that there's actually 7,000 co-ops in the UK um, and another example of a healthcare cooperative established in 1985 by welfare recipients, it's a social care co-op that today has over 800 worker owners they pay themselves 20% above the industry average in New York and exper experience very little staff turnover. They set a metro area's industry standard for quality care and they actually give women more of a voice in the social care sector and around their pay. Services like the under cooperatives are not reduced to increase profits for shareholder dividends and instead of having a union to negotiate, members represent themselves using a the democratic methods. So all I'm suggesting is that with this action plan, we're going to promote a culture of cooperation coming out of the COVID crisis and um, that we introduce cooperative models of businesses when we're introducing people to different types of business models. So I know that Jennifer Clough runs mornings where she supports people setting up and starting up small enterprises and I asked her do you in, do you suggest a cooperative model and she says no why would I <laughs> um, so this is my argument for that but I'm not going to say I think we should set up 10 co-ops in the next five years okay thank you um, I just say it's not scaring my horse um, I mean you've mentioned cooperatives you've mentioned credit unions um, is there any room in here for mutual societies, which doesn't seem to appear in, in, in any of this, as somebody who worked in one for 30 years? Yeah, it's the same as a credit union, isn't it? Um, well, the, the principle was that people invest so that other people can borrow. So mm. yes, it, it's a similar principle. I think we've got plans coming forward for a credit union. Okay, thank you. I believe Councillor Adams wanted to come in here. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just just around the co-ops, um, and uh, I know you, you mentioned uh, the worker on co-ops, which is which was great. Do you think there could be scope to implement this in terms of our health and wellbeing strategy to try and get um, local residents more involved in the decision making um, in those and actually have uh, a direct influence in terms of health and wellbeing in their area? 
I mean, I, I think this is one that when we talk about kind of social value and procurement, in particular, Council Adams, I think this is one of the key areas where there's a gap, certainly around around health and well-being. So I think there's a real opportunity to make this community wealth building um, action plan not only about hard economic outcomes, but also about kind of some of those softer um, health and well-being um, issues as well, particularly in this current time. Um, around around COVID-19. So I think there's a there's a, a synergy and there's a relationship between this action plan, the corporate plan, the health and wellbeing strategy, and the community strategy as well. So I think they all need to be looked at in the same in the same sort of light, effectively. Uh, and I believe Councillor Matt Trafford, you wanted to come in here. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was just wondering if there's any particular motivation that sort of hasn't already been mentioned about already existing companies wanting to um, convert into a co-op and if there's sort of any particular examples out there of companies that, or businesses that, or institutions, whatever, that weren't co-ops and now are and, and where we could sort of see some good practice of that. Yeah, so like I said, Co-ops UK, they have, um, they, they support a network of 7,000 co-ops um, but that includes, if you look on the website, fan-owned football clubs and farmer-controlled businesses as well. Um, so co-ops do exist. And the UK, the law doesn't favour them. Um, but, you know, if we're setting up small enterprises... And one example that I used in the workshop was that the, I spoke to a lady who worked for a franchise hairdresser. Um, and she said to me that she'd earned £9,000 for that franchise and she only got paid the living wage. So she decided to set up on her own. Um, and then just by chance, I went to see her when she was set up on her own and she was in a hairdresser's, which she was paying the overheads for with five chairs in it, but on her own. So I think, you know, a hairdresser can probably only fill two chairs at a time. Um, so in terms of conversions, I think it would be really good if we could offer people opportunities to take up cooperative models where she could invite other partners in or members into that hairdresser, ask them to pay towards some of the overheads, which sharing the risk, but then also sharing the surpluses as well, um, where she's, so she's not on her own, but she's part of a co-op. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Thurlborn, I think you have a a question on CLES. Yes, to Matthew Buzrak Jackson, I do apologise if I've got your middle name wrong. What is the Centre for Local Economic Studies? CLES. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, so the, the Centre for Local Economic Strategies is an independent think tank um, and research organisation uh, based in Manchester. Um, undertakes a range of work around economic development, regeneration, local governance. Um, I used to work for the organisation. I, I, I spent 13 very happy, happy years working there. Um, the organisation utilised learning from the United States to bring the concept of community wealth building to the UK um, and has been undertaking work around that for probably about the last 12 to 13 um, years. Um, the organisation is not funded politically, it's completely politically independent. Um, um, and the organisation seeks to address poverty, inequality through more effective uh, economic development practices, um, which is effectively the organisation's mission. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Michael Green. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, if I can refer you to the second bullet point from the end of page 34, and it's just a query as to whether um, by introducing toolkits uh, to demonstrate social value, that might act as a disincentive to small local suppliers. Thank, thanks, Councillor Green. I think it's actually the toolkit is designed to support and help uh, local suppliers and small businesses. Um, so it's designed to be a, a brokerage um, tool so that if if a supplier is asked to kind of detail um, what type of support they're going to provide for the unemployed um, as a part of a question in a procurement exercise, they know which organisations locally can potentially provide them with assistance in that and to provide them with um, a ready-made group of people that could potentially help them to deliver that outcome. So it's far from being complicating the process for small businesses and local businesses, it's actually designed to assist them 
in this process of embedding social value into procurement. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Will Adams. Thanks, Chair. Um, take you to page 45, paragraph 4.4. Um, in terms of uh, pillar four, the socially just use of land, how can we ensure that this land is used to the benefit of our communities? Uh, and where do you see this being put in practice? And also a question, I'm not sure if this is for the um, for the cabinet member or maybe for, for Jonathan, uh, how much land does the council actually own in South Ribble? Uh, all fingers seem to be pointed at uh, Jonathan Node at the moment. So if you would like to come back. Uh, I've, I've not got a figure to hand in terms of how, how much, but we do we do have a, a very wide portfolio um, of land in, in the borough. Um, obviously, we, we own a lot of um, commercial premises that we rent out to tenants in, in the borough. Um, so obviously, in terms of working with those tenants and assisting them and, and on, on that, I think that's, that's an important area. Uh, we then got other areas of land that we own, most of which is public open space. Um, and, and is protected as such in the, in the local plan. But then we do have, have some a small number of, of potential development sites in, in the borough um, as well, and, and potentially we'll, we'll be making acquisitions in the future as, as well. So I think it's, it's quite important that we, we make the best use of, of those assets um, and, and basically help to create the conditions for the rest of this action plan. So, so a few questions ago, we talked about cooperatives and, and I think it's important that, that our assets portfolio can, pre can create an environment for those, those actually actually develop and, and grow, grow and e exist. Um, sorry, I forgot what the first bit of the question was, Councillor Adams. Uh, just in terms of the socially just use of land, not really just use them from land. How do you see these people in practice? Sorry. Uh, yeah, so basically just the social just use of land. So um, where can we sit, put this into practice in South Ribble and, and how can we ensure that this is the benefit of our communities? Yeah, I think the answer lies in the behaviour of other anchor institutions. This isn't just about the assets owned by um, South Ribble Borough Council, but also by the, the NHS and, and other organisations. So I'll just give you an example from Birmingham where they uh, opened up some of the land around the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital um, and every week they have a, a farmer's market, for example, that utilises that land. So it's about utilising that land for different uses um, that were previously kind of closed off to the, to the community. Um, and that, of course, has had a range of um, not only community benefits, but also health and well-being benefits as well. So it's about working with those other institutions to open up their land and assets for, for community use as well. Thank you. Um, is there any possibility of, of us finding out what land we do own? So, certainly we do, we do have the figures in terms of hectares, acres and, and numbers of units that we own. And things like that. We, do, we do have, term, have even that. where in terms of open space. I said even where in terms of open space. Yeah, yeah, we can break it down geographically as well by, by ward, ward, ward level or something like that. We can certainly supply that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and finally, you'll be pleased to know, we have a question from Councillor Matt Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can the scrutiny committee play a role in monitoring the action plan moving forward? So the way I understand it is that it will go to an implementation plan and I'm sure that scrutiny can be involved in um, looking at that periodically. Um, I don't know if Gary might want to come in on that. Thanks, Anya. Yeah, that's in the, the gift of the scrutiny committee. Um, they want uh, updates and then obviously we can provide them. Yeah. Right, I think given the importance of this, uh, we most certainly would. Um, I may well be speaking on behalf of all of the committee, but uh, Councillor Adams. Can I just ask one final question, please? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we've talked a lot this evening about uh, social value um, for the last three decades, which started under Prime Minister Thatcher. I think the UK has seen a, a kind of a, a procurement strategy that is going to the the, uh, the lowest price, the lowest bidder, uh, which is sees us in this year the kind of the charity state that we now have, unfortunately. How do you feel that the social value that you're talking about this evening and in, and is in the report? How, what kind of benefit do you think that would bring to the residents of South Ribble? So the way I've explained it, this to um, a few people is to like imagine a pound coin with a pie chart on it. 
um, and each, and then you would have a percentage, for example, of that pound, which would contribute to the environment, a percentage of it that would contribute to um, um, jobs and employment, a percentage of it that would, um, so, and, and I did actually speak at full council about what the, the definition of social value was. So, but in terms of our local residents, I think I alluded to it before, where I said that what I hope to achieve through the communications is case studies which resonate with local residents about how they've got more opportunities at apprenticeships for the children um, and that kind of thing. I don't know if Matthew's got some examples. Yeah, I think I think this is also about kind of the extent to which people are able to respend back in the local economy. So by utilising more local organisations to deliver goods and services and to use more socially responsible organisations, that in turn has knock-on consequences in terms of wider outcomes. I think there's two tiers of savings here there's and benefits here. There's savings for the state because less people are kind of claiming unemployment type benefits and there's a, 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 a kind of natural saving for the state through that but also there's a local economic benefit in terms of people's spending power and their ability to invest in local shops and upon local services as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so with your pound example then, it is, it, it is the Wigan model because that's a pie chart. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, if I could. <laughs> So if I could bring in Councillor Green to sort of bring it back more to a more serious level. Then. Very good, Chairman. Um, could I ask one, one final question, if that's okay, please? So, so on, on page 26 of the report, it sets out the risks uh, and the risks relating to not adopting the action plan uh, and the loss of some potential benefits. Um, would the Cabinet member agree with me, though, that there, sh there should be an additional risk in there that if we do actually introduce the, the action plan. There, there is a risk that, that if this goes badly wrong, we, we wouldn't attract businesses, we wouldn't attract jobs for residents, and we wouldn't attract training opportunities, particularly for young people, and we wouldn't attract the funds that we need to support vital services for the residents of South Hibble. Thank you. I find it very difficult to agree with that risk. Um, speaking to business people that are members, um, myself, um, They've said that to get a contract, that they would, you know, do a lot towards social value. Um, and I just think that more and more places are asking for this. And like I said earlier, Howard Anton is getting requests from businesses asking how they can add more social value and how they ha how they can support local communities and businesses. So in, we're not we're not going to spend money um, that hasn't been um, properly monitored. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I, I don't. I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that risk. Can we take that as the answer? Oh, sorry. I, um, I think I think by adopting this council agreement, it will also present the opportunity for businesses within South Ribble to grow um, and to bid for procurement opportunities elsewhere. So if a if a if an organisation starts delivering a contract on behalf of South Ribble Borough Council, they're developing their capacity and their capability to actually develop their productivity and their output and their skills in the procurement process. Um, so it also enables them to bid for procurement opportunities elsewhere in Lancashire and elsewhere in the country um, as well. So I think it's an opportunity to both grow the economy but also socialise the economy as well in terms of some of those in terms of some of those outcomes. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I move on to recommendations, are there any members not on the committee who might like to ask anything or state anything? If not, I'm going to ask uh, Darren to actually read out the recommendations as he's scripted them there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if I just summarise some of the um, things that I picked up as themes from the meeting and if members wouldn't mind um, actually adding or um, commenting on them. So the committee thanks the Cabinet Member, Director and uh, Mr Bakriza Jackson for attending and the detailed report and action plan. The committee recommends uh, that um, it looks forward to the performance measures being developed as part of the implementation plan expresses disappointment that the report and draft action plan does not include engagement with businesses and looks forward to this being added. 
the committee welcomes the suggestions to promote the benefits of community wealth building with residents. The committee asks that the final draft of the action plan be presented to full council following the member briefing. That more explicit links be made to the community strategy and health and wellbeing strategy. Information on the council's land ownership be provided in the future. And the committee looks forward to receiving progress reports on the action plan as soon as they are available. Thank you, Chair. OK, are we happy with those or is there anything anybody would like to add? Uh, Councillor Green. Thanks, Chairman. Um, thank you for those recommendations which, which have been drafted. Um, I, I note the point about engagement with businesses. I think we need to widen that and engage with business organisations and further that we should formally consult with the business org organisations that I set out earlier. So, so those were the Chambers of Commerce, the FSB, the IOD and the CBI uh, before this report goes to Cabinet. Um, I, I welcome the Learning Hour which has been included in there uh, and the reference to it going to full council, um, but I would stress that that needs to be a formal vote of full council because we need to get buy-in from, from the elected members uh, moving forwards. Um, and I would like something to be put in there to cover that risk that I set out, that by introducing this action plan, there is a clear risk that we would attract less businesses, less jobs, less training opportunities such as apprenticeships and less funds to support services which are vital for the residents of South Fibble. Thank you. Right, I think your last point I'm going to have to put to the vote because I'm not convinced everybody's going to agree with that. Um, so if I can take a vote uh, as that, as an amendment to the recommendations, uh, those in favour? And though, one, two, three. Right, those against. I think that final point is lost, I'm afraid. Is everybody happy with everything else that Councillor Green mentioned there, apart from the final point? And so, Councillor Foster. Yeah, it's just, just a point of um, clarity that the, the the scrutiny committee can obviously request whatever they want, but I, I don't think the scrutiny committee can demand uh, uh, that a, a policy is taken to council for council to vote on. Um, I, I do think that needs to be worded carefully. It can be it can ask the cabinet or the executive to consider anything and everything in which we would, but I, I don't think the scrutiny committee can to, can pass a a recommendation to take something to council to be voted upon. Thanks, Chair. Um, I do agree with you, and my understanding is that that is a request, not a demand, because you're quite right, we, we, that's not within our remit. So we would request that you take that to the full council. Um, are we all in agreement with those recommendations as amended? Uh, that seems to be a yes, so my microphone off. So if I can thank Matthew for coming along. Um, thank everybody who's taken part in that particular item. And that takes us on to item seven, which is the scrutiny portfolio update, community engagement, social justice and wealth building. And it is Councillor Aniela Belinsky gelder uh, once again. Thank you. I apologise having to listen to me all night. Um, this is going to be quite long because if you've read the report, you can see that it's wide, wide scope. And I will try and just touch on the points as briefly as I can, but let you know what's going on as well, because this is part of the COVID response. So again, I'd like to really thank the officers for the continued hard work, particularly throughout this very difficult time where the demand has increased massively, but the resources have not. For the last 10 years, the Local Government Association predicts that 60 pence in every pound has been cut from local government funding. Yet South Ribble has managed within this context to adapt and support our businesses and communities throughout the unforeseen COVID crisis. So I'd like to summarise the report now as quickly and as succinctly as I can. So as it says in point six, the portfolio of services and projects has and continues to respond well to these demands, whilst at the same time maintain business as usual under difficult circumstances. Point 10 is a list of projects which we've managed to achieve in the first 16 months projects and policies which were delivered in the first 12-16 um, months. So that's 11 new projects and policies. 
Due to the changes to the um, council tax support scheme, it means that residents which may be struggling um, now with the changes to working hours or income will now not need to worry about the extra bills um, or accumulating debt. They will automatically fall outside of the council tax charge bracket. And this is actually now, as it says in the report, over 2,000 people. So that's 2,000 people we're not administrating for or trying to collect debt off and things like that. Another point to mention in terms of debt is that the Citizens Advice Bureau is now moved and stationed within the Civic Centre um, with advisors and support for people struggling with debts. The Civic Centre has become a one-stop shop really for people needing support from the Department for Work and Pension, the Job Centre, the Gateway, which is the South Ribble element, and the new Citizens Advice Bureau. They literally just need to go to different floors in the same building to get all the advice that they might need. Um, there is an extra bit which is the one front door but I think Jennifer if anyone asks any questions or would like to elaborate on that um, can talk a bit more about that um, in the questions. Moving to point 13 you can see clearly from the graph that there's a number of calls in quarter one 2020-21 has suddenly increased by just under 10,000 on the previous year and obviously that's due to Covid additional to the 2,000 we've got for the new South Ribble together. Point 16, customer satisfaction remains high despite the huge unprecedented rise in demand. Um, point 18, I think we see excellent results. Quarter 2, 2019-20, where the number of abandoned calls has remained below 15%, even in the first quarter of 2021, when we received an enormous number of calls. And I would suggest this is probably due to the replenishment of staffing in the gateway. Since quarter two, percentage of calls answered within 90 seconds has also met every target over 40%. Um, on the graph in the report, the green line is slightly too high. It's at 44%, so it should be at 40%, so all the targets have been met. Point 22 talks about the channel shift. It was one objective of the digital strategy that we target shift of 40% away from telephony and face-to-face -face channels. Um, it was predicted to take around two years. We've observed a huge change in habits, almost meeting the target over quarter one, between quarter four and quarter one, from 22% to 37%. And obviously this has got a lot to do with the COVID response where people haven't been able to come into the, the gateway. Although COVID has expediated this shift, I have to say thank you to Paul Hussey and his team because we're obviously already prepared for the shift. If we had not been ready, the residents may have become frustrated, may have been very difficult to ask them to make that transition again. So to have the capacity there ready was really good. Moving on to the SHRIT, which is the South Ribble Integrated Team. This team, um, which is made up, I mean, you can ask questions about it, it's made up of police and different partners that take on responsibility for some of the most vulnerable people in South Ribble, usually deals with around four or five cases. Um, at the moment, it's dealing with 43 live cases. So you can see how the, the demands increase. More and more people have been identified through the crisis as being vulnerable and needing um, needing support to access the right services. For example, increases in domestic violence victims and disabled and elderly. Um, moving on to the final bit, which is around community hubs and the old neighbourhood forums. The next section is a combination of the implementation of community involvement strategic review and a rapid response to the COVID crisis, which the establishment of the South Ribble Together Hub and the new community hubs. So point 53, which is a table, shows that what we've achieved. So we've affiliated with the Cooperative Council. We've completed one of three resident surveys, as promised. We currently, we, we now have just recruited three new staff and um, the last two, I think, are due to start on Monday um, and they're to support the new community hubs, um, support the new community hubs um, and then hopefully they'll they'll start doing the ward walks and organise meetings and agendas. But obviously each area has to decide the best way to meet um, and I think that's a discussion that's probably going to start um, pretty soon. I did say to Rebecca and Jennifer that I would like to have had the first meeting of the new community hubs before Christmas, um, but I'm not sure if that's viable now, um, although I still hope for that. Um, positive um, 
meet with oh yeah and also we continue to meet with um, parish councils and partners um, in a virtual and um, I think we met I think we met them virtually and um, in person and um, spending making it easier oh, and we've also made changes to the governance arrangements and made spending easier which is what came out really strongly in the um, the, the, the cross-party working group I introduced the volunteer policy at the last cabinet meeting, so I don't really want to talk too much about that. Um, and the South Ribble Together Hub um, and the supplementary agenda, which is attached, is what would normally go to cabinet. But I think the cabinet agenda was too heavy last time, so it was taken out, but it's there for people to see. It does include some case studies which illustrate, although anonymously, some real stories of real people that are struggling and suffering due to COVID. And it'll inform us, the case studies inform us, where we need to fill in any gaps and help everyday people that are trying to just to survive. Okay. Uh, perhaps I could ask the first question. Uh, what are you most proud of from your portfolio over the last year? I think the amount <laughs> that we've done. Um, oh, it's a positive question. Um, when I look at the list of policies, I think the fact that we preempted the COVID in one respect by taking people out of the council tax requirement meant that those people, you know, that might have now fallen into it, they don't have to deal with that. So for me, poverty um, and people managing the finances is a really important thing. Um, and the the community hubs, I think, um, the response, the way that the officers have managed to run the South Ribble partnership, but then adopt that strategy because it's worked so well. And now we can have these multi-partnership agencies in each area geographically to, um, to support residents. OK, thank you. We only have positive questions in this committee. <laughs> and the next one is from Councillor Chris Lomax. Hi. <clears throat> Do you feel the breadth and content of your portfolio is appropriate? Um, I think I know what you mean, but because everything actually links so nicely together, it dovetails. Um, I think that maybe the community wealth building bit is an extra bit, but um, but the community hubs, the gateway, um, and all the council staff, to, all the council tax stuff, that's all about our residents, about um, practices of care um, around our residents. Um, so I do, I do think it all it dovetails together. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Colin Sharples. Thank you, yep. Yeah. Uh, page 61, paragraph 19, compliments and complaints. How do we learn from complaints to improve customer service? I think Paul Hussey might be on the line um, and I think that he's probably best placed to answer that. It's also the first time we've had phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Is Paul Hussey on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much for the question. Um, yes, I mean, every, every complaint is full of thoroughly investigated and as part of that investigation, um, any learning that we can take from it is then shared um, with all members of the team. We have a um, regular uh, learning and training session which allows the team to learn from um, any complaints um, and we also capture all of those complaints in a consistent way so that we can learn from, um, so we can um, ensure that any um, common themes are addressed and that does help us in terms of um, um, improving uh, overall customer satisfaction with the service. Okay, thank you. If I could bring in Councillor Michael Green. Thanks, Chairman. Can I um, can I thank um, Councillor Boinsky gelder for, for the uh, overview of her portfolio? Um, can I refer her to the bottom of page 61? and the talk of channel shift. Um, for, for the benefit of perhaps thousands of residents who might be watching this meeting this evening, uh, could she first of all explain what channel shift means? I, I think I understand what it means, but, I, but if, she, if she could put that into plain English, that would be helpful for the residents, please. Um, and further to that, what steps are being taken to ensure that those who are unable to engage electronically are still able to access the services and support which they need? Thank you. 
Thanks for that, um, Councillor Green. Um, channel shift is, um, I think that maybe Paul Hussey should come in and correct me on this, but um, channel shift is where we go from traditional methods like telephone or even face-to-face -face in the gateway to using Twitter, Facebook and things like that so that residents can make complaints or say there's a full bin or any or that the brown bin hasn't been collected but more informal ways where it doesn't take up necessarily so much of the time. Um, the gateway is now reopened and people can make appointments so the traditional, I'll call them, um, methods and media for contacting the council are still available um, and I'm not sure that we've had any blockages or anything like that. I think Paul might be able to expand on that. Paul, would you like to come in? Certainly, Chair. Um, the portfolio holders has essentially covered everything I was going to say. The only thing I would add is that um, we are also delivering um, a tremendous amount of training for members of the public and our residents um, to support those who are uh, digitally excluded, um, which will obviously support us in terms of our channel, channel shift uh, um, aspirations. Um, and we intend to report on the details of that um, under uh, Matthew's portfolio and we can provide that information at a, at a later date. But we've made some significant progress on that working with our um, uh, uh, Lancashire Adult Learning colleagues. OK, thank you. It's probably a bit of irony that those who can't engage electronically won't have heard any of that. But, um, if I can bring in Councillor Thilborn. Yes. Uh, could you please, uh, can I re refer you to page, top of page 62, the first sentence? When will the new website be rolled out? And what difference will you see in the new website? Um, yeah, can I bring Councillor Matthew Tomlinson in? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, I, I want him to. Oh, I'm oh sorry, that's. Were you, were you creating the echo? Um, I wanted to talk about channel shift, uh, first of all. Um, I think it's really important going forward that we um, strive to push uh, this. It, there's a lot of research that shows um, someone coming into the Civic Centre for advice um, costs the council 14 to 15 pounds for each contact. Um, and a telephone call costs around five pounds, but a contact done digitally costs us pennies. So there's a, there's an enormous incentive for us to pursue uh, channel shift, but also it's more convenient for many, many of our residents. We all um, sit at home now, or many of us do, uh, with the iPad on our knee, uh, doing some online shopping, ordering our food to be delivered, um, but they can't at the moment report the fact that the brown bin's missing or, or anything like that. Why, why is that? Why, why can't a borough council be as modern, um, as accessible um, and as um, open to its customers as a multinational bank um, or, or a, a national shopping chain? We really need to be on the ball on this. And so I think that's why we've been uh, pushing it as much as we have. As we said, as um, Councillor Belinsky gelder said earlier, our target for 2022 was to get 40% um, of our contacts um, to be digital contacts. And we're already up to 37. Clearly, a lot of that is because of COVID, but I'm glad to say we were ready for that. Um, and we've got we've got to uh, continue to drive that agenda forward. Um, and certainly, um, from my portfolio's point of view, it's about making sure the resources are in place uh, to to make that happen. And that's something I work very closely with both Councillor Bolinsky Gelder and um, Paul Hussey uh, to make sure we're ready for. It. As um, the website, I'm hoping um, we were all consulted on what um, which type of um, website we would like. We were given three options. I don't know how many members took part in that consultation, uh, but um, there was a clear uh, choice for one of them. And I can't remember, <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid off the top of my head, which one it was. Um, but we, we are uh, 
uh, now well advanced. Um, a lot of the migration, so all the information that was in the old website had to be ready in the new website. Um, and the conversation I had with Paul Hussey a couple of weeks ago intimated that there'll be a version that members can have a look at before Christmas. Um, and then we'll go live um, to our residents uh, early in the new year. We probably could have gone live to our residents just before Christmas, but I don't, we, on reflection, we don't think that's the best time to do it. Uh, people have got other things on their mind. Um, and if we are going to go live with a new uh, website, we want to get the comms around it just right. Um, and, of course, we want the website to be absolutely ready. So the version that we'll be able to see in December uh, be really encouraging member feedback. Um, and we're hoping you'll explore it uh, and, and test it out for us. But um, sorry, that was a very long answer to a very short question. Uh, we should, the website should be ready uh, early in the new, very early in the next new year. Thank you. Can I bring in Councillor Matt Trafford? Right. Can if it's on page sixty-three, can I bring Councillor Matt Campbell in first? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to refer to page 63, paragraph 43. Uh, what do we think the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic will have on council tax and business rate collection figures? That's got to go straight to Paul Hussey because he looks at the recovery rate. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is a small decline in recovery, but it's not significant. Uh, Paul, do you want to add to that? Yes, Chair. The, um, the portfolio holder is, is absolutely right. We are keeping it, keeping it under review. In terms of council tax, um, the comparison with last year, um, we've seen um, it's actually 0.96 um, uh, reduction. And in terms of business rates, it's a 3.91% uh, uh, reduction. Um, but as I say, we are, we are keeping we are keeping it under review. Um, we have um, um, continue, we will continue with uh, our um, standard recovery uh, arrangements uh, in line with policy. Um, and as I say, we're keeping it, uh, we're keeping it under review. But um, yeah, the general uh, summary is um, not a um, significant impact uh, to date. Thank you. Uh, can I bring Matt Trafford in now? Thank you, Chair. Um, on, the, on the same page, just going back to point 36 um, in the resettlement scheme um, about welcoming five Palestinian families, obviously um, the, the situation since the occupation is absolutely dire and sort of as much support needs to be done as possible, as soon as possible. And it says we're still waiting for an arrival date from the Home Office. I was wondering, has there been any time scale? Has there been any updates since this was reported? My, my only worry is, is that this could be kicked into the weeds or perhaps forgotten by the Home Office. Um, so the information I have on this is that David Cameron said that we had to take in a certain number of refugees um, within a two to three, four, five year period, a certain number per every two years. I think Paul will be able to elaborate on this, um, but it isn't, it's it's not a matter of that they won't, it's not, not that it won't be kicked into the long grass. Um, you know, we're due to receive those families. Um, let, I'll let Paul elaborate. Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, port, portfolios covered it really. The only thing I would add, as, add is that as at today, to date, no dates have been confirmed for the next cohort. Um, we were originally uh, planning on re, re, uh, welcoming um, the, um, um, the the new cohort in November. That is highly unlikely now. Um, the latest conversations I've had with the Home Office would indicate that it'll be at some point early in the new year, but we don't have a, a, a specific date as uh, as yet. Okay, thank you. Um, can I bring in Councillor Will Adams? Thanks, Chair. Um, page 64 now, uh, paragraph 49. Um, all activity to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is to be commended. Uh, I think the administration have managed it well. Moving forward, though, are there sufficient resources and staff in place to continue our response 
and obviously with the government's um, new package, if you like to call it, uh, for tier three um, lockdown, do we feel we've got sufficient resources at council to provide ongoing support, both from, to businesses and also to local residents who, who may need it? Um, I will we'll pass you on to Jennifer. I think Jennifer Mullins, the person to answer this, who's been working really hard. She's managed to get the test centre up and running. Um, and she said to me a few days ago that um, they have to be ready on the back foot all the time to get everything back in place. So in terms of resources, I think that Jennifer might be able to tell us more about that. Um, it's an extremely complex picture. <laughs> That's all I can say with COVID. Um, a lot of things that are coming into us are coming in very short notice um, and it's very difficult for us to organise our staff um, and organise the resources. Um, as we currently stand, we're able to cope with what we've got. Um, we're doing the community hub, the test and trace, test and trace support payments, the business support payments and the enforcement work. Um, we just have to understand um, what the next thing might be that in is introduced. We are looking at the staffing. Uh, we are going to be looking at reinforcing the staffing for our teams um, with the expectation um, that we'll have an increase in um, numbers of um, activities that we'll have to deliver. So it's a very, it's a moving picture, but we are getting the resources in um, and we are hopefully going to be able to reinforce the team, uh, both in Gateway, Environmental Health and in the Community Hub itself. Thank you. Thank you. Could I bring in Councillor Foster? Thanks, Chair. Um, just, just to slightly enhance uh, Jen and Aniela's responses there, the, the, I think it's fair to say that the, the Council um, is in control of what the Council does control directly, if that makes sense. And we are putting extra resource into staffing, we're putting extra resource into the community hubs. Uh, some will have heard me on the Radio Lancashire earlier and we're most certainly putting extra resource into the, the feeding of the children and the holiday hunger, for example, and that we, we're absolutely convinced that that will need to con continue through through the winter. Where we do have concerns is the elements that we're not in control of and what I mean by that is in direct response to Council Adams' question is the businesses, local businesses, because clearly we paid out over £20 million of um, business support grants that we received from the government, if you remember, on the first tranche of payments back in the uh, in Easter and early summer. We have not got anywhere near that level of resources now from the government whilst we're in tier three. I think we're probably going to be looking at nearer a million to two million pounds maximum for our local businesses, and that's to cover a six, a six month period, Will. So there are some elements that we clearly are in control of and we can resource and we'll continue to resource. But I do have huge concerns about the sustainability of a number of our small and medium enterprises within the borough. Rest assured though, we'll do everything we possibly can to support them. But we need more financial support from government. They need more financial support from government. OK, thank you. Councillor Adams, do you want to come back? Yeah, uh, Councillor Foster has um, pretty much answered the question. I think it's just I've been contacted by quite a few businesses now. We're very nervous. Obviously, this, the things in, they've seen in the media uh, and they're very nervous about the prospect of not getting uh, sufficient um, resources from government. And obviously, the council would um, facilitate that to them. But I think uh, in terms of how we move forward, it's uh, it's, it's good to know that the, the, the administration will carry on keeping the pressure on government to ensure that you know we can actually support our businesses here in South Rivers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Chris Lomax. <coughs> uh, the resident survey is in. The results have been published. How have the results been used? Um, the resident survey isn't actually within my portfolio. I don't think. I think it's within the leaders because I had. Um... Um, yeah. Sorry, oh. Annielle, you've just been sacked. <laughs> if I can bring in Councillor Foster. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Annielle. Um The resident survey is within the community wealth building uh, portfolio. However, the to be fair to to, to Aniela, um it, it's it's been. The, the cabinet and the, the senior directors have, have used this resident survey to very much feed into the the, 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 the new corporate plan that's just, the council has just approved. 
and also the this the and how we're going to monitor progress and we've used we've basically used the resident survey council law maps for baselining where we are currently and then it's also highlighted a number of areas that i think the scrutiny committee will have picked on upon historically where the authority needs to improve so it's in it's now baselined it's part of the corporate plan and the the new resident surveys that are done in the i think we're doing them manually now actually will then feed into how we're actually performing and delivering um the, the requirements of the local um the residents ultimately okay thank you um if i can move on to councillor colin coulton thank you chair uh, i'd like to mention the uh, my neighborhood homes uh, what decision making will be devolved down to the homes and at the start of the financial year we prepared some uh, budgets for uh, spending within the homes if something cropped up during the year that wasn't in that budget how do we go out about accessing uh, funds uh, an example i want to create a western parishes wheel a cycling wheel which would cost you know, I don't know how much, a few thousand pounds. So how would I, would we have to prepare a, a justification for that spend and then put it through the system? So how would that work? Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, in terms of the procedure, it's not all that different um, because the hubs are kind of establishing themselves with the new staff. Um, they will be getting new priorities um, as well. And that'll be based on what the chairs, vice chairs and local residents feel like the priorities are. Um, but that project specifically for you, you would just put that through the hub. Um, if it was within the budget of the hub, um, like for example, like a Leyland Live, I don't know what you mean, in, I don't know what you're looking at in terms of a budget, but that would just come out of the usual um, community hub budget. But if it's a larger project where you want more money, you would have to apply to the central um, £25,000 pot um, and there's a project um, application for you to fulfil. Um, the officer working on your behalf, I envisage, would fulfil that um, project and it would have to meet certain criteria um, and then it will be agreed or disagreed that you'd get access to that central pot. Uh, thank you. Perhaps if I can add to that. Um, thank you. I mean, back in the day of area committees, each area committee used to have a devolved budget and they could spend it on what they chose to spend it on. Um, and it was very much adding social fabric to the area, small schemes. Um, in Penwith and we had one road that was completely inaccessible because it was unadopted and we just bought some stone and filled it in. So, so will the hubs have a devolved budget that they can decide what to do with? Or are we going to have to be summoned to the headmaster's office as we were under the previous administration um, to answer ourselves as to what it is we want to do? Um, so thank you for that. You will not be summoned to the headmaster's office. Um, you, the decisions will be made more autonomously than they were. Um, even the decisions around the spending has changed. So chairs and vice chairs can spend it off. After consulting on the cross-party working group as well as the, the member workshop, it was clear that um, the community, the neighbourhood forums as they were, needed and ended up costing around £250 to get any small amount of spending because all 15 members needed to sign it off. Um, the new one is a lot more streamlined. It's been through governance and once the priorities are decided and the projects are decided in each area, um, chairs and vice chairs can sign it spending off. Okay, thank you. Can I bring Councillor Tomlinson in thank first? You, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, um, Councillor Coulton asked what he would need uh, to progress the Western Parishes uh, hub or wheel or whatever he wants to call it. Um, I would suggest the first thing you will need is a lot of patience. Um, I first proposed the Leyland hub, uh, uh, the Leyland wheel, sorry, in 2008, I think, or nine. Um, it's been adopted as, as, some, as an aspiration of the council and parts of it have been delivered, uh, but it is enormously enormously complicated to do any of these things um, 
But if he gets um, the Western Parishes hub to adopt it as something that they want to progress uh, and we can get it um, as a council aspiration, then we can start looking at the budget process um, and seeing how much it's really going to cost and what we need to do to deliver it. Um, and I say that from a supportive point of view as somebody who rides a bike. You're depressed, yeah, that's 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 a bit long in the two, so I'll put it <laughs> hope to see it happen. It's whether you're long in the legs that really matters. Um, could I bring in Councillor Green? Thank you. Um, the portfolio order has just set out that the priorities for each hub would be set by the chairman, vice chairman, and local residents, presumably those local residents that engage. Um, she didn't make reference to the other elected members. So does that mean about 40 of us are going to be excluded from the process or, or was that just a slip of the tongue? Yeah, um, I thought I did mention the members. So that's my error. No, OK. Thank you. If I could move on to Councillor Karen Walton. Thank you, Thanks. Chair. Uh, reference on page 68 is made to the hub chairs agreeing a community development model and including involving parish and town councils and other relevant partners. Um, as we've not had a, any hub meetings, and I understand why, and you've told us, explained to us what's going to happen in the future, I do think that we could have met digitally, and I think there has been a lot, lack of information uh, from hub chairs uh, to members of, of the uh, community hubs uh, and so when we attend parish council meetings we don't really have a lot of information to provide but that's that's something that I think we should really think about. Uh, what mandate did the chairs have and information did they have to agree this and should hub members not have been part of the, the decision making and been consulted? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think that I appreciate the delay that you're talking about um, and I understand that. Um, but I do think that the community involvement team, as it was, has actually been resourcing the South Ribble together. And um, so their, their priority has changed um, slightly to supporting food parcels and um, telephone calls and things like that. Jennifer might want to speak more on that. Um, there are blockages because we didn't have the staff in place. They are now in place. Um, and although the members might not have heard anything, I did speak to the chairs and vice chairs of each area. Um, I think it was in June or July, and we decided between us how we would move forward, um, how we would be consulting. Um, so if, if I can pass on to Jennifer, just to add in there. Um, just to reiterate, um, the, the team as it stood has been working on the um, Community Together Hub and the additional information that we've sent through just shows you the amount of and breadth of work they've been doing for our vulnerable residents during the, the COVID crisis. So it details in the report all the different projects they've been doing um, and also includes um, some information about case studies that we've been doing. It also shows a, um, a model that we've been developing um, with regards to our supporting our communities um, through the COVID crisis. And we continue, hopefully continue to develop that model um, of resilience for our communities. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Can I, just bring can in I come back on that, David? Well, could I bring can in council? Yes, can I bring in Councillor Foster first, and I'll bring you back in. Thanks, okay. thanks, Chair. I'll be, I'll be really quick. It's just in, you mentioned Karen the uh, liaison with the um, the town and parish councils. Um, I can update the scrutiny committee that the the cabinet has been conscious that this has uh, been challenging over the last few months, and we did hold a meeting with all the. Uh, town and parish councils approximately 10 days ago, I think it was, updating them on everything that was going on within the borough. Okay, Karen, would okay. you like to come back in? Yeah, yeah it's, it's just, just that, that I, 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 would, I would like to make the point that um, the chairs or vice chairs of the hub have not really been in contact with the hub members. And I, I appreciate all the work that you've done, Jennifer, and your team. I'm not um, really in any way criticising what the officers have done. I do think that if the chairs and the, or the vice chairs were given information, it should have been passed down to the hub members. 
Uh, so can I just bring in Gary Hall? Thank you, Chair. I, I think, you know, um, the discussion has been along the lines of, you know, we've been in a, a crisis. Uh, things haven't progressed as we might have liked, um, including the development of the hubs. The, the challenge for us is that this thing is going to be with us for the next, who knows how long, uh, six to nine months. So earlier in the, the meeting, uh, there was an ask about resources. Um, we met actually only this week um, to identify additional resources because what we're doing is we're drawing from core staff. That is not a sustainable model. Otherwise, we do nothing else around the council. So um, just to pick up Karen's point, we are going to be appointing additional staff, which will free up those staff who currently seconded into working in the hubs. And we hope that in, in the very near future, probably after Christmas now, I think, um, we'll get on to developing the hubs and putting the right resources in to make sure chairs are supported because chairs and vice chairs and the hubs require support, which will mean all the issues that you allude to, Karen, particularly in terms of communication, et cetera, hopefully should start to be resolved at that point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Matt Trapper, do you want to come in? It's, it's been covered by um, the Interim Chief Executive. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Can I then bring in Councillor Jackie Olty? Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, what are the priorities for your portfolio moving forward? Impressive as it is, what are your next steps? Um, thank you for that. I think just managing to stay on top of it. Um, I think implementing the um, community wealth building element, but also really trying to get these hubs um, on the ground and get the people in the communities which really need the support at the moment, get them the support through these hubs. Thank you. And can I bring in Councillor Will Adams? Thank you. Just in terms of talking about priorities. Um, Regarding the uh, South Rebel Integrated Team, I won't uh, use the, the shortened version. Uh, as somebody who works with people in crisis, often on a daily basis, I often despair at the lack of community support, which often leads to an individual who requires further support going back into the hospital environment. Um, just from reading the report, the, the team um, do great work. And I can tell you, uh, as working with these individuals, that they truly do change people's lives. Um, so with that in mind, uh, with the demand on this team likely to increase over the coming months and potentially years, do we have sufficient resources in place to cater for those additional needs? Thank you. I think the finger's being pointed at Jennifer here. Yeah, um, so we have put in a resource into South Ribble Integrated Team from the Council. So we've put in a um, business manager um, from the Council into the South Ribble Integrated Team. So somebody from the Council uh, would organise the team, chair the team with the police um, and organise the workload with the team. Um, she has um, traditionally it had been a two day a week job. Um, to do that. Um, during the COVID crisis, it's been a full-time job. Um, she, we have committed to that. Um, now the uh, South Ripple Integrated Teamwork is now in with the community team as well. So it's been transferred into the community team and we've got resilience in that team to support um, the officer and to support the work that she's doing. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of questions from the committee. Are there any other questions from people not on committee? In which case, um, could I ask Darren to take us through recommendations that have been noted? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, potential recommendations include that the committee thanks the Cabinet Member for the, her detailed portfolio update. The committee commends the work uh, of the new portfolio since it was created last year. The committee praises the Council's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the support provided to residents, businesses and communities. The committee welcomes the reassurance that the My Neighbourhood Hub model would be developed further for the new year. And the committee wishes the Cabinet Member well with the portfolio priorities moving forward. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Can we agree those recommendations? Does anybody wish to add anything? Uh, Councillor Colton. Oh, you don't wish about anything. You're just agreeing, right? Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thank you to Councillor Annie 
<laughs> Thank you, Annie Hill, <laughs> for what has been a very long and I'm sure difficult session, but you, you've come out the end of it. Um, Councillor Tomlinson was nearly right in that he will be on at eight o'clock. It's now five past eight. So before we move on to item eight, I am just going to take a two minute interlude for a comfort break. And then we'll be back in two minutes. Okay, thank you for your patience during that short interlude. Um, we're now moving on to item eight, which is the Worden Hall update. And if I can uh, welcome Councillor Matthew Tomlinson, uh, supported by Jonathan Node, to introduce this item. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, and I think we've got uh, Neil Anderson in as well. So um, I'm well, well supported this evening. Um, can I just say I do um, I do welcome this still being on uh, the agenda because it really does give us an opportunity to um, have a little pause and just see where we are up to and reflect on what progress um, has been made. Um, I don't want to go into the background um, at all, really, because I'm sure we're all uh, fully aware uh, of this project, but really just to focus on uh, paragraph 11 or bullet point 11 on page two uh, that looks at what recent activity um, it has been um, taking place. So whilst um, not a lot for people to see in terms of actual um, work being done, you can see there uh, that a lot of the preparatory work um, certainly has uh, been done in terms of uh, surveys, um, both ecological uh, and environmental and uh, building conditions. So there's a lot um, been going on. Uh, bullet point 12 uh, talks about what we intend to do uh, next. Um, we're not where we wanted to be um, and we can use COVID as an excuse for a while. Um, and I'm happy uh, to accept that as a reason, sorry, not an excuse, as a reason for us not being where we wanted to be. 
um, but we still need to crack on. Um, and as you know, I'm quite personally invested in this project um, and offices are aware of that too. Um, but with that, I don't have anything to add to the report um, other than to say I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Uh, and if I can't answer anything technical, I'm grateful for the officer support I've got. Uh, thank you. If I could ask the first question, if you go to page 77 and the top bullet point, um, I think there is perhaps a concern about this may well be overrunning in terms of budget. So what is the expected cost of the project? What if the works cost more than the budget allocated? Is there a plan B? Um, the original budget of 2.170 million, million pounds, 2.17 million pounds, including some contingencies. Um, oh, I'm getting an echo. I'm sorry. Um, it did include contingencies. Uh, that remains, and that is a conversation that I've had um, in very strong terms uh, with officers, and they informed the consultants of that fact too. Uh, thank you. Right, if I can bring Councillor Marsh in now. If you want to turn the microphone back on again. <laughs> These new gadgets. Um, when this all this is done and dusted and finished, and I'm sure it's going to look superb, what's it going to be called? Is it still going to be called Word and Hall? I have to say, Councillor Marsh, um, its final name uh, really hasn't crossed my mind. I have no intentions of not calling it the... It, well, uh, Councillor Evans, who, um, as we all know, is the font of all knowledge of the history of buildings in Leyland, would inform members that this is actually the Derby wing of the old Worden Hall, uh, because most of the hall burnt down in a fire in the 1950s. Um, but I have no... Um, I haven't really considered it, Councillor Marsh. I'm sure if uh, the scrutiny committee have any sensible ideas, I'm certainly not going to call it Holly McCall face, um, but if anybody has any sensible ideas, I'm sure we'd be happy to listen to them. But at the moment, the intention is that it will be called Word and Hall. Thank you. Oh, rather, it's the Derby Wing than the Derby Shire, but there we go. Um, if I could bring in Councillor Colin Sharples. Thank you, Chair. I think this question is likely to be on every time we bring this up. Uh, what is, when is the project expected to be complete and are the building brought back into use? OK, so if, you, if people um, looked at the capital programme that we all agreed at the budget meeting in February, the intention is to spend the vast majority of this 2.17 billion in the next financial year. Um, and that remains um, my aspiration. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thurlborn, did you want to come in? Yeah, just a quick technical follow up on page 76, the item 11, second to last bullet point. Uh, what's the thinking behind the ground source heat pump? Okay, well, th th actually, this came about partially because of a point that was raised at the last scrutiny committee um, when committee asked about the carbon footprint of uh, this development. Um, and uh, believe it or not, you know, um, we do listen to the ideas and comments of scrutiny, even if they're not in the official recommendations. So it's something um, we're, actively, um, we're actively investigating. Um, and I'll be happy to come back when a decision is is imminent. But it, it you know, we, we use old fashioned technology to heat uh, uh, Word and Hall. Um, it's got a, a, a oil boiler at the, at the back. It, it, it's a big old unit uh, that takes up a, quite a big uh, amount of space. Um, and if there are other opportunities for heating the place, then I'm more than happy to look at them. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Karen Walton. Good evening, Matthew. Hi. Um, just a question on page 77, first of all. Uh, the car park extension, rather than a new car park to meet planning requirements, including external lighting, this could reduce costs mm. in this area. Where will the car park extension be? 
Well, in, on the original uh, plans, um, they wanted to um, extend the car park to allow for uh, more people to park when there were larger events. Um, and that would have actually um, meant taking down some fairly substantial trees. Um, having had a, another look at it, we think there's very much the potential um, of not extending it as much as was originally envisaged. Um, and not only that, would that mean we can we can keep some of these trees, which obviously, as everybody knows, uh, trees um, are a big uh, part of this administration's uh, policy. Um, it means we could save a bit of money as well. And so there would be disabled parking there as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, right. yeah like, you know, we this this development will be fully DDA compliant, as you would expect, um, and we'll make sure that happens. So, how many parking spaces do you envisage there will uh, be? I don't know. Um, I does anybody? Know. I don't know. Does anybody no. know? Uh, Neil. It's something you've got back to us. Yeah, Chairman, we, we, we can bring that information back. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, we could bring that back to yeah. the meeting. Uh, but my main question is, uh, by how much do you expect the project to have moved on when scrutiny meets again in January? OK, well, if, um, by then, I'm hoping we'll have submitted a planning application. Yeah. Um, we, we're working already. Um, a, a member of the planning team is already working with the consultants um, we're hoping to submit the application before Christmas um, and then it, um, I would imagine it would go to committee in uh, in February or March. Um, but, I mean, work will continue and it is, you know, as I say, we fully expect to have a planning um, uh, application submitted to the council before Christmas. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Right, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we don't have any members not on committee still here, so um, if I could ask uh, Darren to take us through the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Um, the committee thanks the Cabinet member for his detailed update. The um, committee looks forward to an update at the next meeting, including further details of car parking arrangements. Thank you, Chair. Are we all agreed with those recommendations? Yes, in which case, thank you, Councillor Tomlinson. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Chair. We now move on to item nine, which is scrutiny matters. Uh, item 9A is the Lancashire County Council Health Scrutiny Committee update. Um, I attended, I say I attended the last meeting held on the 30th of June 2020. This is virtual, um, so it is all on screen. Um, the first main item on the agenda was NHS 111 first, um, and a report outlined the process and implementation uh, of the new initiative. Um, it's a new appointment system for those who would normally self-present at A&E, and it's supported social distancing and aimed to reduce overcrowding, waiting times, and subsequently COVID-19 infection rates. Um, we were advised the new system would support a better flow of work, make best use of available technology, and should improve clinical outcomes as all attendees will have had a remote assessment prior to then going for an A&E appointment. Um, we were then given a report detailing the supports have been provided to adult social care providers and the adult, adult social care winter plan. Uh, and we did have representatives from uh, two care homes uh, in attendance to provide feedback to the committee on their experience of county council support during the initial stages of the pandemic. Um, in response to questions, the council had been reassured by the Department of Health and Social Care that all care homes, including those for younger people with disabilities, would be prioritised for testing and receipt of results. And moving on, um, something that's very pertinent to ourselves, the committee agreed to the establishment of a task and finish group consisting of seven county councillors and the two co-opted members from Chorley Council and South Ribble Council to review the forthcoming proposals from the Our Health, Our Care programme on the future of Chorley and South Ribble A&E. 
and that was agreed and I am still waiting an invitation to actually sit on that. So that's the um, Health Scrutiny Committee. Uh, item 9B is an update on scrutiny review of health inequalities. Um, the task group has met. We met with the Deputy Leader of the Council and the Chief Executive with other officers uh, and we are in now in the process of scoping the review. We did have quite um, a long session with I think four officers uh, in attendance um, and we have come up with a, a list of areas that we would want to look at and we are going to um, drive those down into a list of priorities. Uh, 9C is meetings and training attended by scrutiny members. Uh, I don't know if anybody would wish to report on anything they've attended. Chairman. Uh, I thought, yeah, Councillor Green, I believe you're at Northwest Employers Network, am I right? Yes, that's correct. I, I attended with uh, Mr. Cranshaw on the 7th of October. Um, we had a presentation from one council on, on steps that they're taking to address the important issue of climate change. Uh, and we also had updates from various scrutiny representatives from across the Northwest as to how they've been um, addressing COVID issues and, and scrutinising how their council has dealt with COVID over the past seven months or so. And uh, so it was interesting to, to hear the, the different perspectives on, on that matter. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, item 9D is the Scrutiny Committee Forward Plan and Work Programme. Um, we have had a number of issues uh, fed into us uh, by members of the committee, which include leisure, playgrounds, the response to the pandemic and rebranding. Um, so if we can put those forward for consideration. And 9E is the Cabinet Forward Plan. Uh, and members are asked to flag up any items on the Cabinet Forward Plan that scrutiny might be interested in considering. I suspect I might have covered both areas there. So unless there is anything else that people wish to add, uh, that does bring us to the end of the meeting. So thank you for your, your, your patience and participation in what was somewhat of a marathon. Um, but I'm sure it has been well worthwhile and good evening and enjoy the rest of your night.